the Palm Palace was possibly the most luxurious hotel I'd ever stayed in, with dozens of floors, casinos, buffets, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and even a massive arcade. One of the many perks of this fabulous job. I was thinking to myself. Because of my previous work as a war photographer, I was hired by this marketing firm, Adams Company. The morbid affairs of war and American politics took their toll on my psyche, and my shrink suggested something lighter to pay for the years of depravity I witnessed firsthand. It didn't take long before I find this new job, in fact, it found me. The people who hired me were excited to get me on board, suggesting that they specialized in scouting famous locations with hidden scary histories or something along those lines. There was apparently a huge ghost hunting craze going on cable TV, and Adam's company was in charge of finding the few locations that hadn't been visited to death by paranormal investigators. Personally, I thought the paranormal was nonsense, I was certain that the true hell was on earth, but it was a surprisingly well-paying job with full support from my therapist, so I took it almost immediately. Plus. With advantages such as free travel and stays at four-star hotels like the Palm Palace? That is unbeatable. I walked through one of the many automatic glass doors, having already given the bellhop my very small luggage to take to my room. The lobby was spectacular as well, with multiple cafes and lounges and a clear view of one of the casinos. I approached one of the women at the check-in desk which had no lines since it was the middle of the week during the off-season. Yes, I have a room reserved through Adam's company, the name should be under Jack Jones, I said as I rummaged through my wallet for the necessary credentials. She smiled brightly as she raised her hand. Oh, no, Mr. Jones. We've been waiting for you. She replied in a foreboding tone. I froze my blood freezing. Please pardon me. The lady laughed. I didn't mean to make you nervous, Mr. Jones. The entire staff knows why you're here, to help us in establishing the Palm Palace as a haunted hotspot for T.V, right? In response, I laughed. Of course, yeah. Sorry, I didn't expect everyone to know why I'm here. To be honest, we're all very excited. This place is filled with ghost stories that the staff would love to tell you. But don't worry, we'll let you settle in and enjoy the Palm Palace's non-ghostly comforts. The night staff, in particular, will offer you the best experience. The woman chuckled and handed me a variety of cards, including one that allowed me to gamble at the casino with money provided by the hotel, a buffet card for food, and, of course, my room card. I was in room 1883 on the 8th floor. It was far from a penthouse, in fact, I was a little disappointed that the room was more similar to a standard hotel room, two beds, a television, a microwave, the essentials. However, I quickly got over my disappointment because of commodities more than made up for the bad quality room. It also had a beautiful view of the coast, which was only a mile away from the hotel. I went to use my new cards extensively because I had arrived only a few hours after noon and had plenty of daylight to burn. The casino initially treated me well, with a few machines allowing me to win big before taking it all away which was normal of my past gambling experiences. This led me to the arcade, where I discovered that my casino card also worked and spent way too much time playing crane games and shooters. My growling stomach then led me to the massive buffet, where I picked various meats from the separate regional dishes sections, with their angel hair pasta being particularly delicious. I finished just in time for night to fall and fatigue to creep into my head. Seeing how much I ate and the slight layer of fat forming on my stomach, I decided to take the stairs for some exercise before taking a short nap. As I approached the bottom of the stairwell, I was struck by how empty and, well, haunting it was. 
I took out one of the cameras I'd brought with me and took a few pictures. I took a few earlier, but there wasn't much to document other than some sad old people losing their money in the casino, so I mostly just took some location shots earlier. However, the stairwell gave me a completely different vibe. For the first time since arriving, I was creeped out, and there was a dark cloud of sadness in the air. I took a few pictures of each new floor, mostly as an excuse to take a break, and when I got to floor 18, I took a few more. I turned quickly to return to my room, and more importantly, my bed, for a nap when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. I twisted around again, chuckling to myself at the incredible sight of nothing. This haunted shit is making me see things. I shook my head, thinking aloud. I swear I saw a figure crouching at the top of the stairwell, but it was only for a split second and couldn't have been something other than a mental trick. I walked out of the stairwell, ignoring the quick, odd sucking sound that reminded me of sobbing as just the door creaking. However, before I could get to my room, I noticed a maid exiting from my door. She was short and young, perhaps a year or two younger than me, with bright blue eyes and brown hair. Normally, I would have been annoyed because I had not requested house cleaning and had not been in my room long enough to make a mess, but her adorable appearance distracted me from that fact. Oh my goodness, Mr. Jones. Please accept our apologies. We simply wanted to ensure that your room was in excellent condition for the duration of your stay here. I'm out of your hair. She squeaked softly, almost timidly. Is everyone here familiar with my name? I thought, but put on a friendly smile. Don't be concerned. I understand. I'm just going to take a quick nap before my night interviews. I reassured her as I walked past her to my front door. Do you want to share any stories later tonight? As I swiped my car and placed my hand on the handle, I inquired. Her eyes glowed. Oh yes. I've had some scary situations here. If you need to find me later tonight, I'll be working out a problem in 1723. Besides, there's still daylight left, so it's better that way. These stories are best experienced at night. By the way, my name is Anne. She replied with laugh. In turn, I smirked at her. I'll go look for you first, Anne. The maid laughed some more as she winked and waved goodbye as I shut my door. Finally, my bed. I thought as I face planted into the mattress, looking up only to set my phone's alarm for two hours and then falling asleep almost immediately. Nightmares don't usually follow you into the real world, so that when I woke up from a restless sleep, I assumed my ordeal was over. I didn't normally have night terrors, but after watching some horrific shit documenting war, it was only natural that I did on occasion. My mouth was as dry as shit and tasted about the same, so I stumbled out of my warm bed and headed to the bathroom. I yawned as I relieved myself, trying to figure out why the feeling of dread had not yet left my body. A rustle from behind the shower curtain drew my attention, but yanking it back quickly revealed nothing. I laughed to myself as I turned to face the mirror just as it exploded. It happened so quickly that I couldn't process it without shielding my face with my arms. I hunched back, groaning in pain, but thankfully, the majority of what hit me was embedded in my forearms. The horror that stepped through the broken remains of the mirror, on the other hand, almost made me wish the glass had blinded me. He was me, or a demented version of me, emaciated and covered in gore from the numerous mouths that peppered his body. If it hadn't been for their constant gnawing at the ear, I would have assumed they were tattooed. The only non-horrific difference between us was the false me leering from behind his wall of thick black hair. The false me made no noise other than gnashing his teeth, even when his bare feet walked across the broken glass. The closer he crept, 
the stronger the fear that gripped my body held, until he was right in my face, his upper body and head licking his lips. Two of his macabre hands wrapped around my neck. It wasn't until the pain of his palms jaws chewing on my throat shocked me into action, grabbing a large glass shard and jamming it into his stomach and twisting. The false me let go immediately, and his dozens of mouths screamed in pain. Hurt me! Hurt me! I didn't bother waiting for his retaliation. Instead, I kicked the false me in the stomach, driving the glass deeper into his stomach while also knocking him back, freeing me. I dashed out of the bathroom, ignoring the small glass shards that had become embedded in my saws. I reached into my camera bag, my eyes still fixed on the bathroom door. It turned out that keeping an eye on the bathroom was a wise decision. The false me crawled out, his bones snapping into place as he stood up, his numerous mouths returning to their fervent gnashing. He charged at me, his hands open to take another bite out of my neck. Bang! The shot rang out, knocking the false me off course and causing him to crash into the spare bed. I forced my gun into the main mouth on his head and blew his head off before he could recover. I waited for a moment, holding the gun to the center of his chest in case he resuscitated, but none of his mouths moved, and when I was satisfied, he was dead. I collapsed onto the floor, horrified. Wait, what the fuck? What the hell? I cried to myself, unable to process what had happened. I felt like I'd been thrown back into the middle of a battle, but instead of being on the sidelines, I was the combatant this time. But I forced myself to regain as much composure as possible. I quickly changed into fresh clothes and pulled the glass from my feet and arms, likely in an inhumane manner, but I felt my room was no longer safe to be in. However, after attempting and failing to call anyone on the phone, I started to worry that this was the case all through the hotel. I slung my pack over my shoulder, fresh clothes and bandages wrapped around my arms and feet, and counted my bullets. The Glock 17 lived up to its name, and because I kept it fully loaded, I still had 15 rounds to spare. I took a deep breath and slowly opened my door, my gun pointed. My assumption was correct as a quick look into the hallway noticed that whatever was going on wasn't linked to my room, entrails and other assorted gore covered the walls, and the hallway appeared far more run down than it had before. I nearly retched at the steaming piles of apparently fresh innards that surrounded me, pulling my shirt over my nose to cover up the horrible smell. A blindingly fast figure pushed past me, nearly knocking me down. I quickly regained my composure, almost stepping out to see what the hell had just passed me, but there was no need. It returned to me. As a being with the appearance of an impossibly tall man crouched down by my door, sniffing the entrance, every ounce of my being was required not to make a sound. He was obviously blind because the top of his head was missing. A large plumage of brightly colored feathers replaced the top of his head, as if it had been a clean cut right above the nose. I slowly raised my gun but held off on pulling the trigger. This thing was thin and gangly and obviously attracted the sound, so the gun would either work perfectly or completely backfire, which was not a risk I was willing to take. The feather man continued to sniff the feathers on his flat top head rustling occasionally as his face approached my body. Sarah? Sarah, where have you gone? A shaky voice called out, catching the feather man's and my attention down the hall. One of the elderly people I'd seen earlier in the casino had wandered out of his room, a feeble old man who moved around with a walker. The feather man initially refused to leave his spot at my door, leaving me powerless to warn the old man and prevent him from making any more noise. Sarah? I hate these decorations because they terrify me. Sarah? He continued to call. A grin shaped on the feather man's pale face as it tilted its head. 
As a bystander, I watched as the old man shakily pulled his glasses from his nightgown, a look of horror spreading across his face as his gaze fell upon the decapitated head of an older woman, whom I could only deduce was Sarah. No, Sarah, Lord in heaven above. The feather man descended on him with his final utterance of his love's name. It was a terrifying sight, because the feather man was easily faster than any Olympic sprinter, despite being severely hunched over. The monster appeared in front of me in an eye blink, and the next he was lifting the screaming old man. I went to aim my gun, but when I noticed that the other side of the hallway, the one that turned a corner and led to the stairwell, was clear of danger, I knew which path to take. However, I couldn't take my eyes off the scene in front of me. The feather man wasted no time in approaching the old man. Thank you, God, Jesus, our Lord and Savior Dash as the feather man wrapped his massive hands around the geezer's head. Its smirk became wider and wider. The old man continued to pray as the feather man's throat stretched and his mouth widened, revealing a horrible-looking peafowl creature from its unhinged maw. It was only the bird monster's head and neck, and it appeared to be some unholy cross between a vulture and a peacock. The bird twitched its head, and the feather man's hands pried open the crying old man's jaws. The peafowl slammed its beak down the old man's throat, ripping out his tongue and vocal cords with one more twitch. The feather man let the corpse fall to the ground before kneeling beside it to allow the bird to continue feasting on the body. As the monster gorged itself, I crept around the corner, away from the horrifying sight. As I turned the corner, a sigh nearly escaped my lips, but I was able to keep it quiet. The door to the stairwell was completely clear, so I reached for the handle to push it open, slipping on an intestine strewn across the carpet, and my finger instinctively squeezed the trigger of my gun. My brain was able to operate quickly enough after the explosion of sound, twisting my body around to fire off one, two, three, four rounds at the body of the feather man, who had already cleared the corner it was mere feet away. I was about to fire the rest of my bullets at the monster when I noticed he had come to a halt, sniffing the doorway again, feathers ruffled in agitation. That's when I realized it didn't seem to be able to leave the corridors. I was hesitant to test that hypothesis, but circumstances forced my hand. I quietly shut the stairwell door, and the feather man did not react. When my assumption was proven correct, a massive wave of guilt washed over me. I could have saved that old man. I slammed my arm against the wall as I watched the feather man leave the door and walk back up the hallway through the vertical rectangular window. Fucking coward, I yelled at myself, gritting my teeth and wiping away my tears. The whole thing had been messed up, and the monster wasn't even dead. I may have fired blindly, but I managed to hit it three times as evidenced by the impact marks on its body, but that abomination didn't care and must have only barely noticed. As I descended the stairs, I came across a chubby young black man sobbing against the wall, but when I went to help him, he turned to face me, displaying his slit open wrists with his veins still pumping blood. Why? Why did she abandon me? Was I insufficient? He wailed but I pushed him off of me and dashed down to the ground floor. Just as I was about to enter the main lobby, the sobbing man's wails and a sickening splat filled my ears once more. I didn't turn around because the splash of a warm substance on my back confirmed my suspicions. I rushed through the lobby, everything distorted from what I had seen earlier in the day. When I arrived, the receptionist was no longer alone. Her head was affixed to a stake, as were the heads of several other female attendants, and they were being operated like puppets by some grotesque beast made entirely of snake tails, with no head or body in sight. I saw the chubby black man a few more times, but he seemed useless, only wanting to beg for answers to why and dive to the ground floor, only to reappearance a few floors up. 
through those small stairwell door windows, I even caught a glimpse of other monsters that resembled the Feather Man, sniffing around for their next victim. I eventually made it to the top of the hotel, where I was greeted by a typical coastal city night sky after crashing through the door. The town below was still lit up by the lights of numerous bars and other businesses that remained open. Cars occasionally moved up and down the streets. Even the bottom of the Palm Palace appeared normal, with the lobby entrance clearly above ground. No way, what the fuck? Wait, what the fuck? As I ran towards the stairwell door, I stammered and staggered back. I crushed inside and looked down the massive flight of stairs, the chubby black man was only a few flights down. Blood was gushing from his arms as he looked up at me. Why? He dialed the number. Fuck! I yelled as I stormed back out onto the roof and fired all but one round into the night sky with my gun. I began sobbing as I leaned against the building's side. Those bullets were my last option, a desperate attempt to draw local authorities to my location and save me from this hell, but I should have known it wouldn't be that simple. I noticed something, or rather three somethings, as I looked out into the fading night sky over the coast. It started with just a few ripples in the water, but as daylight crept over the horizon, three massive, solid back obelisks appeared. Each one was identical, with about a hundred feet between them. I had no idea what they were or what they were for, but just seeing them filled me with more dread than anything else that had happened that night, as if they were made of pure terror and fear and absorbed that energy into anyone who dared to look at them. When nothing happened, I crawled up onto the edge of the hotel roof and fired the last bullet in their direction. The sun had nearly fully risen, and the obelisks were nearly at the beach. I didn't want to see what horrors they would unleash on the world, so I took one last look back at the hotel before sauntering off the edge, 34 stories below. Screams and shouts, as well as some unfamiliar voices, filled my ears almost as much as the constant ringing. Jesus Christ, send an ambulance. Did he jump? He should be dead. Christ Jesus. A familiar voice spoke up. Please step back. Medical personnel will be here shortly to transport him to a hospital. It was the receptionist, and she should have died. That's when my eyes opened and I saw what was left of my mangled body. My legs were practically a red paste. One arm had nearly broken off due to the impact, and the other was somewhere twisted under me. Yug him off. I tried to speak, but all I got were broken teeth, blood, and a piece of my tongue. As an ambulance reached, the receptionist looked down worriedly at me, shooing the small crowd away. As the EMTs rushed in our direction, she knelt beside me, smiling. She leaned in and said, almost inaudibly, I hope you enjoyed your stay at the Palm Palace. You promised to interview me, Jack, and the hotel kept your promise. It dropped you right outside this room while I was cleaning up for another of our guests. He was quite disorganized, so I needed to speak with him directly. She explained, nodding to the naked corpse by the rack on the floor. When I noticed my gun and bag on the floor near the bathroom, I created a plan. I made the choice to keep him talking. How did you get here? To this location? I asked, slightly squirming as she leaned on the bed with a smirk, mainly laying her head on my stomach. You already know the answer, Jack. It's the main reason you've come. Because the Palm Palace is haunted, you obviously want the best haunted experience possible, right? She laughed, barely digging her nails into my stomach. But this is true, why is it true? because authenticity is best, and the Palm Palace provides. Now, let's get started. We've already lost most of the night. I launched my knee up before she could finish, slamming it into the side of her head. I yanked both hands free with all my strength, 
tearing through my skin, but eventually freeing myself. I grabbed and by the head and kneed her again, this time in the face, pushing her into the side of the wall as I hopped off the bed and grabbed my bag and gun, double checking that my ammo was still there. I turned to face him, who was now bloodied and mad as hell after noticing the gun in my hand. You're running low on bullets. She snarled and jumped over the bed to pounce on me. Before I dashed out into the hallway, two bullets hit her, and when I slammed the door behind me, I saw her getting back up. Luckily, when I returned to a stairwell entrance, she wasn't following me. I then noticed the floor number, 16, and my thoughts returned to my original goal, the roof. So I ran as fast as I could up flight after flight of stairs. When he noticed me, a waiter with the lower half of a millipede was scurrying around, fixing himself a plate of horrific obscenities, his mandibles spilling out of his mouth. Hello, Mr. Jones. Are you here for seconds? I could tell you enjoyed the angel hair pasta. He laughed as he pulled a human scalp with blonde hair from the buffet. I retched once more, but this time I felt something strange in my throat and pulled a long mass of blonde hair out, a small chunk of meat still attached at the bottom. The millipede waiter laughed some more as I violently threw up whatever was left in my stomach, but his laughter was cut short when I shot a bullet through his head, causing his body to lurch over in his face to become a pile of maggots. I quickly left the buffet, attempting and failing to gain back my composure. I had no idea what to do when a moment of clarity struck me. The roof. I remembered looking out my window when the false me attacked, and the view was the same as before, implying that only the ground floor was buried. If I could make it to the top and determine how deep the lower floors are buried, I might be able to escape this hotel. I took the elevators this time because I didn't want to see the aftermath of the stairwell man's jump and they seemed normal. That is, until I walked into one in the walls, floor, and ceiling began to throb, and large, white teeth hung down from the doors. I'd walk right into a mouth. I was thrust upwards into a fleshy throat and blacked out before I could act. I awoke to pleasant humming, and as my eyes fluttered open, I saw yet another horrifying sight. The room had to have started out as just another standard hotel room, but it had been cleared out for a number of small and large torture devices. As I watched the current occupant's right arm slowly being ripped off as he screamed for mercy, the main attraction was a massive torture rack, simple in design but effective in its purpose. His torturer was, predictably, another horrifying being, though still a familiar one. And. The maid I had met earlier, was dressed in a very revealing dominatrix outfit and walked on nothing more than unnaturally long and exposed broken leg bones. She turned in my direction and smiled as she kicked a lever on the rack behind her, allowing the tortured corpse to fall to the ground. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Or should I call you Jack? After all, we're about to meet on a much more personal and intimate level. She purred, moving closer to me with more grace than one might expect from a shattered broken bone. She seemed weightless, and the two bones protruding from the ragged flesh of her exposed legs were never a hindrance. How did I end up here? I questioned, shaking against my restraints. She tapped her fingers along my chest her nails long and caked in blood, as I was tied to a bed with string. I also noticed that the string was small and weak. How's it going, Mr. Jones? Do you want to go? You have everything you need right there in your hand. The receptionist laughed, her bloody head jostled by the mass of snake tails miming her mouth moving. When I looked down at my gun in my hand, I realized what the head was implying. Rather than complying, I flipped her off and considered shooting at the disturbing sight, but decided to save the bullets. 
My original plan of walking out the front doors was quickly derailed as I peered through the lobby's glass doors and massive windows. I couldn't see anything outside. What looked like dirt and rock blocked all ground level exits. No, 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 and oh. Slamming a chair against the glass, I screamed. It breaks as expected, but my hopes of the ground floor's buried state being an illusion were crushed. It felt real, and there was no way for me to get out. The row of heads behind the reception desk laughed at my weak attempts, and I escaped to one of the nearby casinos in frustration. This proved to be a bad decision, as the casinos were not spared the hotel's terrible transformation. The machines were still brightly colored, but wires and tubes had sprouted from them and had penetrated deep into the skin and orifices of their patrons. As I spun around in horror, I realized it wasn't to kill the people they'd kidnapped, but to keep them alive while they were forced to continue playing their games. The players would scream and struggle as their blood and organs were taken as payment for a game, and the slot machines would fill them with a strange blue liquid that appeared to sustain their kidnappers. The slot machines were scurrying around like massive insects, and three of them started approaching me, their tubes and wires whipping around like tendrils. As I dashed away, I fired three shots into the machines, and two of them shut down as the bullets pierced their screens. I dashed down another corridor and stumbled into the dining area, where the macabre sight of human gore, fingernails, severed animal heads, and squirming maggots, among other foul things, made me vomit. Thank you for joining us for this terrifying story. We hope you enjoyed our horror story and that it gave you a good scare. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more horror stories and other creepy content. Don't forget to leave a comment and let us know what you thought of the story. Did it keep you on the edge of your seat? Were you too scared to sleep after watching it? We love hearing from our viewers, so be sure to drop us a line and share your thoughts. Until next time, stay safe and remember to keep the lights on. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.